All right. Let's go back 25 years. How many of us remember carrying very powerful computers in our backpacks, in our small backpacks? Answer is probably none of us. Or better still, let's just go back 10 years. How many of us carry such powerful computers in the back pockets of our tight jeans? For a younger audience, this is also a phone somewhere here. You know, call your parents, that's why they bought this for you. Yeah. <laughs> so the processor here, you won't believe it, it's a million times faster than the processor, than the computer, which was on board the Apollo mission to the moon. That's how amazing these technologies have become. So my question is, and probably you must wonder too, how did we get here? Where, where did we start? How did we start? Where are we now? If you want to make such amazing progress, what do we need to do? What are the challenges? So let me take you on this incredible journey about how computers, you know, modern computers came into being, why do we need them, how do we go forward? And in this talk, what I'll also uh, discuss is some of the ideas that we are pursuing in making the workhorse material for electronics, which is silicon. Silic it is silicon which runs all our computers. But there are challenges. So our idea would be, can we make this workhorse material, silicon, perform new tricks, and this time new tricks with light? And also, very importantly, new tricks with light at very, very small sizes. And by small sizes, I mean nanoscale, where nano is a billionth of a meter. So can we make something like this? So silicon nanophotonics, turn off the dark. Let's begin. So human beings have always made machines to help them perform tasks that we are not very good at. And computing, or com uh, com computing is one such task. Although we think we are smart, but we are really not very good in computing or dealing with large sets of numbers. So in, the older, uh, in, in olden times, we were assisted or we developed what is called the abacus, and it was a mechanical machine. And in more recent times, we moved on to the slide rule. But these are mechanical devices. And the rate at which you could perform calculations was really limited by the rate at which you could move things around. And that was very slow. And it all started to change when, start, when people started to put together or assemble all electronic computers. And one major advance was what you see on the screen was, uh, was an all electronic computer with no moving parts. And this was assembled at my home institution at the University of Pennsylvania in 1946. This computer, this beast, occupied a large room, almost the size of this auditorium. So, and, it, and it cost around half a million dollars in 1946, very expensive. Nobody wants to pay half a million dollars for any computer today. So that's how expensive it was. It could perform around 5,000 calculations per second during its time, which was you know, almost 100 times more than any other machine before its time. So the basic functional unit in this, uh, in this ENIAC, in this computer, was what is called the vacuum tube. Many of, many of you, you know, from olden times would remember what a vacuum tube is. These are large, pretty large devices. You, could easily, you can easily hold them in your hand. And uh, vacuum tubes basically perform two functions. It, can, it acts as a switch. It can turn the current on and off, a requirement for your electronic devices. And it also amplifies the signal. So this ENIAC used around 18,000 of these tubes. And since these tubes, individual tubes, were pretty big, you can imagine if you want to pack 18,000 or 20,000 of these tubes, it would occupy a large room. So then clearly something amazing must have happened. That's why this thing has shrunk down to the back pocket of your jeans. And this, was the, uh, this led to the discovery of modern transistors. So around the time when people were assembling, using known components, vacuum tubes to make computers, other researchers were looking at some other ideas. And in 1947, Bell Labs uh, announced that they had made the first transistor out of germanium. And this transistor was incredibly small. It, the size of this transistor was typically around five times the thickness of the human hair. Can you imagine a vacuum tube that you can hold in your hands very easily, more than a centimeter size uh, structure, and there's something around five times the thickness of the human hair. But it was still big, so many advances, evolutionary, revolutionary advances over the last half a century led to what is, the modern, what is today the modern transistor. This transistor, and this is not even today's transistor, this is from 2005. The size of this transistor is a thousand times smaller than the size of a human hair. It is so small that if you want to look at this transistor, you need a very powerful microscope, almost half the size of this stage, to even visualize this transistor. So you can imagine the great advances that have been made. So one thing is to make things small. The another challenge was when people were making transistors in the initial days, like the 1947 transistor, the question was, OK, each transistor is made in a different process. 
How do you put them together? Each transistor works differently, performs differently. How do you wire them up? So clearly, some, some amazing advances had to be made. And this advance of putting all these things together, which we, which we call now integrated circuit technology, was pioneered at Texas Instruments by Jack Kilby. So what he did in, uh, in his time in 1950s was he, he was able to print an entire circuit, a very rudimentary circuit for that time, of, you know, compared to today's time. But nevertheless, the first time someone printed an entire electronic circuit in one platform. And now you can imagine, you, know, you can start reducing things so much that instead of putting 100 devices, you can put 1,000, 100,000, so and so forth. And, the, and so much so that around 1996, my colleagues at Penn were able to print the entire ENIAC onto a chip which was smaller than the size of a single dime. Can you ima imagine 18,000 vacuum tubes occupying this large room shrunk down to something smaller than a single dime? And this was in 1996, almost 20 years back. It wasn't, it's not even state of the art. Now one can pack almost half a billion transistors onto a single chip, or even more. So clearly we've, we've come a long way. And we have a pretty good idea about how to pack more and more devices onto a smaller sizes. That's not one of the biggest problems. The biggest problem is how do these individual devices communicate with each other, because they don't work independently. A transistor a component has to work with others, and everything has to work together to solve problems. And this is where the problem lies. This communication happens through electrical wires. So electrical wires connect one device to the other. And they work pretty nicely at slower speeds. But when you start increasing the speed of your processor, and you may have noticed, or may not have, but that the clock speed of our computers, it hasn't gone up in the last few years. And the problem is the copper wires connecting these devices. Because when you start increasing the processing speed of your computer, they tend to become very hot, and they also tend to slow down the signal. So what can, we, what can be done? One solution is use light, because after all, light is one of the fastest things in this universe. That's what Albert Einstein taught us. So can we use light? And this is what people are trying to do now. So now the challenge is we have to use light if you want to make our computers fast, but then everything has to be done on silicon. Why silicon? Because this is something that people have researched over the last half a century. So we know a lot about this. Huge amounts of dollars have gone into this. The commercial electronic market is around a few hundred billion dollars. So nobody's going to change this workhorse material. So the only solution is to make this material perform new tricks, and new tricks with light. But the problem lies here. If you want to play tricks with light, you need a material which emits light. Silicon does not emit light. So you have to find ways to make silicon emit light and especially at the nanoscale, especially the same size as the transistor I showed you, which was 1,000 times smaller than the thickness of the head. It's very challenging. That's one problem. Another problem is, if you want to do some computation, for example, 5 plus 7, what you need to do is you need to send a signal corresponding to 5 and then 7, and then the device mixes it up and produces an output. If you want to do this with light, you have to send signal co co optical signals corresponding to 5 and 7, and then you have to do this mixing, and then an output is produced. But silicon is really bad in mixing optical signals. So that's a big challenge. So we need to find techniques to mix signals at the nanoscale. So photonic devices or optical devices exist on silicon, but they're pretty big, as, as I've mentioned. And uh, you know, the idea, the challenge is to reduce them to small sizes so that you can do something uh, with them. So what is the idea? So an ideal idea would be if one idea can potentially solve all these issues. And this, again, is, this idea is basically borrowed from something that we know of, and that is how our TV or radio signaling works. So in radio signaling or TV signaling, uh, signaling the waves that are sent, which, we, we, which with the transmitter, with, with this, uh, what we receive, the wavelength is of the order of hundreds of meters or kilometers. And by using metal antennas that we all know of, it reduces this wave, uh, this wave by around 1,000 times. So by doing this, you're also, one is also uh, uh, producing a lot of optical power locally, and that's how we read the signals. So if we continue this trend, kilometers to meters, 1,000 times reduction, and increasing energy locally, if we, go, if we use the optical wave, which is around a micrometer, can we use a nanometer scale antenna to, to do the same thing, to basically harness all the energy and focus it lo locally? So this is what we've been trying to do. And, in order, and, and trying to make silicon emit light. So how do we make silicon emit light? For anything to emit light, it has to be first provided energy. And when we provide energy to silicon, 
Unfortunately, what happens is there's a fast process, and that basically dominates, and that takes you away from producing light. And the slower process which produces light is completely overwhelmed by this fast process. But if you put a booster rocket on this uh, by putting a nano antenna, then there, is a, then there could be a way of making the slow process compete with the fast process and produce light. And this is exactly what my group uh, reported a few years, years back. By using silicon of the same size scale as the modern transistor, 100 nanometers or so, and putting this metal antenna on top, we were able to produce light by putting a booster rocket on this slow process which produces light. Likewise, again using the same technology, putting a metal nano antenna, you know, kilometers to meters, uh, micrometers to nanometers, we were able to mix signals at the nanoscale with efficiency a thousand times more than any other device. So it was incredible. By sending two red colored signals, we could mix them up locally on the size scale of a transistor and produce blue light. This is the first step towards optical computation. So now we can make many devices, you know, light sources, detectors, we're trying to make a laser, modulators, which can modulate the signal, basically turn on and off, make optical communication devices work. But is this the only thing? That's the question to ask. Historically, what human beings have learned or seen is advances made in one area almost always impact other technologies. So when we are making such small structures, and this is probably the first time we're making reliable structures at such small length scales, which are comparable to functional structures or length scales in biology. So for example, a single virus that attacks us, the size of these devices is comparable to that single virus. So can we do something with this? So the ideas that we are pursuing, pursuing in this area corresponds to, can we make optical devices which are so small that we can go inside cells, not just one or two at a time, but 20 or 50 or 100 at a time. So currently, the optical devices that we have are huge, but the devices that we are making are incredibly small, 100 times smaller than the size of a single cell. So our idea is to go inside the cells with all these incredible optical components that we are making and make these measurements with unprecedented resolution, both spatially and in time. So I'll leave you with this thought, and thank you very much.